It probably will not surprise you to learn that in a survey done a few years ago, the Brussels sprout was named one of the most hated vegetables in the United States. But this miniature cabbage is really just misunderstood. If it's cooked properly in any number of ways, you can roast them, you can fry them, you can steam them, you can boil them, they can actually be really flavorful. So maybe with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of creativity, this much maligned veggie is actually a favorite in waiting. I'm Charity Nebbe. On this episode of Iowa Ingredient, we'll head to Bloomin' Woolly Acres in Nashua, Iowa to learn about growing Brussels sprouts. Then Chef Paul Durr from Prairie Canary in Grinnell showcases the unexpected versatility of Brussels sprouts in our studio kitchen. All that and more coming up next on Iowa Ingredient. Funding for Iowa Ingredient has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. A grant from the W.T. and Edna M. Dahl Trust. Chef Lisa Laval of Trellis Cafe and Chef Michael Laval of the Des Moines Embassy Club. For more than 100 years, the Des Moines Embassy Club has provided a place to dine, celebrate, and do business. Located in downtown Des Moines and in West Des Moines, details are at embassyclub.com. New Pioneer Food Co-op, offering local and organic groceries in Iowa City, Coralville, and Cedar Rapids. Everyone's welcome to shop the co-op, where local and organic isn't just a corner of the store, it's the cornerstone of everything they do. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. Mid-American Energy and their Energy Advantage programs are dedicated to increasing the awareness of energy efficiency in Iowa's homes and businesses. Information is at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Brussels sprouts got their name in the 16th century when they were first cultivated in large quantities in Belgium. These days, many different hybrids grow in the United States. They can range from the size of a marble to the size of a golf ball. And most Brussels sprouts that are commercially grown are grown in California, but they can grow anywhere and they thrive here in Iowa. They've also been becoming increasingly popular with CSAs, farmers markets, and in private gardens. And just like your parents told you, Brussels sprouts are good for you. In fact, they make several lists of the world's most healthy foods. The Brussels sprout may be an Iowa ingredient that is finally ready for its close-up. Any given autumn day in our state, you'll see farmers wrapping up their growing season. But things are very much alive at Bloomin' Woolly Acres. BWA Commercial Gardens is run by Lloyd and Renee Johnson near Nashua in northeast Iowa. We sought a place to live that was on the farm. We've always enjoyed being in the country. And Initially, I had an off-farm employment, but uh, I found a way to plant a garden, and that garden got bigger and bigger, and then we decided uh, it was time to share some of the produce. The Johnsons began by offering their fresh pickings to neighbors, then to farmers markets. They realized they had an even greater capacity to produce and are now selling to grocers, schools, hospitals, and restaurants. One of our dreams, of course, is uh, that we could make a living. And uh, making a living is to be profitable. So we try uh, to develop efficiencies here at the farm as we focus on quality, but never lose the, the joy and, and the satisfaction of growing things. 
we also would like to have an impact, along with other producers across Iowa, in trying to build a better, healthier food system. In addition to dozens of other crops, they grow a wide variety of brassicas, or cruciferous vegetables. You'll find kale, broccoli, cabbages, and lots of Brussels sprouts growing here. Growing Brussels sprouts is uh, both easy and it's challenging. It, a lot of it depends on the, the conditions of soil, uh, the pressure of pests, of disease. If you don't rotate the crops and tend to the soil, you, you can have a number of problems. We've had a wide variety of success. Again, it's how we engage many variables uh, in our environment. Brussels sprouts grow in a spiral pattern along the side of long, thick stalks. They mature over several weeks from the lower to the upper part of the stalk. Harvesting Brussels sprouts is uh, both a great deal of fun and all, can also be a great deal of work. Basically, the, the actual harvesting is, uh, involves snapping sprouts off, usually from the bottom up. We go for a medium-sized sprout that uh, is at least 6 to 12 inches up the stem. The, the ones at the bottom uh, may or may not be full or well filled out. We'll use any that are well filled out and solid. We'll think of harvesting a certain plot, say, at three different times. The last harvest would be uh, perhaps late in October. These edible buds can continue to be harvested until winter sets in. In fact, the sprouts harvested after a frost are said to be the sweetest. I really like Brussels sprouts. With a meal, of course, they're just a real treat. It's almost, you could almost consider it dessert. Part of the joy of uh, producing vegetables is going out there knowing that you have produce that you can sell. But we've had the experience also of, of uh, going into the retailer uh, setting and uh, finding that the shelf was empty. That's very satisfying. It makes the, the idea of local, fresh, essentially organic production for Bloom and Woolly Acres a fulfillment. And uh, it can always bring a smile to my face. I believe we're kind of known for basically taking the simple dishes that people see every day and giving it kind of a twist. Prairie Canary Restaurant and Bar serves comfort food with local flair in a historic building on Main Street in Grinnell. The restaurant opened in September of 2012 and is currently owned by Chef Paul Durr. Prairie Canary provides a gathering place where guests can enjoy Midwestern flavors in an inviting, understated atmosphere. We basically take the Midwestern fare and we kind of give it a uh, kind of an international twist, basically. Um, you know, we're not, we're not your meat and potatoes type restaurant. You know, you can find, yeah, we have great burgers, great steaks, but we also add uh, kind of an international cuisine to the Midwestern menu. Chef Paul doesn't have formal training, but he's been in and out of the restaurant business since college. He says his learning has been hands-on at various restaurants, and he has grown to love the business. What I love uh, about the restaurant business, it's, it's always changing. Every day is never the same. Um, you're always dealing with people, dealing with staff. Um, I get to be creative. Uh, I think that's, that's the great thing about it. You know, I, just, work, just working behind a desk for the time that I did, and I, I had plenty of time to think that, about how I, much I miss the restaurant business, the food service business, um, and being a chef. Prairie Canary Restaurant and Bar is all about being local. From the name of the restaurant to the dishes on which the food is served, effort was taken to showcase local talent and area producers. The main thing is, you know, kind of sustainability of your community. Um, you know, just, just overall, you know, we want people to spend their money here in town. And if I'm showing that I'm spending my money here in town, um, hopefully that transfers to, to our customers. Seeing that and recognizing that 
having us be their first thought when they want to go out to dinner versus going to Des Moines or Iowa City. Um, that's really important for small, small towns, um, especially business in small towns, to you know, support each other. Prairie Canary has an upstairs and downstairs for patrons to enjoy, each offering a different vibe. Downstairs, uh, we're trying to do kind of a sports grill type theme down there. We've got TVs, we do live music downstairs. It's called the Canary Underground. The upstairs is a little more formal, formal dining. It's not, not formal as in, you know, everyone's got to be quiet while they're eating. It's just, uh, you know, um, smart casual, I guess. Enjoy your meal on hand-thrown plates and bowls, sit at handmade hickory tables, savor farm fresh produce grown just miles away. Chef Paul throws in global flavors to keep his guests trying something new and coming back again and again. And now we are here in the kitchen with Chef Paul. We're going to be cooking with Brussels sprouts. What are we going to make? We're going to make fried Brussels sprouts with a chili aioli. All right, that sounds delicious. And we've got oil heating up over here, so we're going to start with the, the sauce. The sauce, right? yes. And that's just it's mayonnaise? Just, just mayonnaise, yep. All right. And I know this is one of the dishes, the appetizers you serve at the restaurant quite a bit. So. Yeah, this is, the, this is probably our most popular appetizer. Really? Yeah. And then we're going to add a little bit of ketchup. All right. And then some sriracha. All right, just to and make it a little spicy. Yeah, I, I like it a little hot, but we don't quite make it that hot at the restaurant. <laughs> so, <laughs> spicy to taste. Yep. And then this is lime zest. All right. And just add that in there. And a little pinch of salt and pepper. It's combined kosher salt. And then we'll finish it off with a little bit of lime juice. And then we'll just whisk it all together. That's and, beautiful. And we're done. And then it's time to fry the sprouts. And now, why, I know that you serve these in the restaurant, so why fried Brussels sprouts? Because it's usually a vegetable that makes people go, really? Well, for, for, some, <laughs> for some reason, over the last three or four years, Brussels sprouts have become really popular on a lot of restaurant uh, menus. And this is just something that's quick, easy, um, you know, cost effective. All right. This is that's another reason we have it on, on and, our menu. And delicious. All right. So what? Okay. You've got hot, hot got oil hot here. Hot oil here. It's about 350 degrees. And we'll just slowly uh, put a few of these in here. All right. I think they're done. All right. Um, and that take, was a fast process. Yeah. It only takes about 30 seconds or so, 45 seconds. And it's important to get them out of there quick. You don't want to yep. leave them in too long, No, right? leave them in too long, they'll start getting bitter, right. bitter on you. And they kind of fall to pieces once they yeah, get in there Yeah, they do, too. they kind of open up. Lots of that sauce, right? Yep. <laughs> it's delicious. And just a little salt and pepper. And then we're going to finish them off with some grated and shredded Parmesan cheese. Nice. Oh, that looks wonderful. Yes, I think. Eat okay. some tongs. All right. There you All go. Right. Terrific. And do you consider this to be a finger food? It's just a finger food. It's All right. No utensil needed, I don't think.
fabulous. Can we try them? Yeah, go right ahead. All right. That's wonderful. You first. All right. Delicious. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And now we're going to make another dish with Brussels sprouts. What's this one? This is pan seared duck breast with braised Brussels sprouts. Awesome. All right, so I, how are we going to start? I'm going to start with adding a little olive oil to your pan. All right, and we've already got this pan hot. And now we're going to add the duck breast. And you've already scored and seasoned yep. the duck breast. It's already been scored and seasoned. What kind of seasoning? Uh, a little Italian seasoning, crushed red pepper, salt, mm -hmm. and a little regular pepper, All right. black pepper. I'm gonna lay skin side down. So we're gonna uh, do the other side. It should have a nice little yeah, sear on it. Yeah, that looks great. And we'll let that cook about a minute and a half. Okay. Now we're gonna transfer it to a pan here. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna put it in the oven. cook in the oven for about seven to eight minutes. All right, and how hot is the oven? 400 degrees. 400 degrees for seven or eight minutes, all right. Yeah. And now that the duck is in the oven, the contents of this pan are precious, right? Yes, they are. <laughs> and to create a little more flavor, we're gonna add some pancetta. And let that cook till it's almost crispy. Okay. Now we're going to add a little bit of garlic to it. About a half teaspoon. It's starting to smell pretty amazing in here. I want to cook this so the garlic doesn't get too dark. Looking good. I'm going to add about two ounces of red onion. All right. You want these to soften up a little bit? Yes. Until they're almost translucent. Okay. And now we'll add the Brussels sprouts, which have already been blanched. All right, and blanching, they're just dipped in uh, boiling just, water and yep, then? Yep, cooked, cooked in boiling water for two or three minutes, okay. just to get them a little more tender. And then do you dunk them in ice cold water to stop the process? Yes. And I love how green and beautiful they look when you get done. Why do you blanch them before you do this? Well, well, in this case, the blanching kind of locks in the flavor a little bit, and also it decreases the cook time that you have to cook the Brussels sprouts for. And then we're going to add uh, some balsamic vinegar next. And we want to simmer in the balsamic vinegar for until about half of it's reduced off. Okay. A little time to soak in that goodness. Now we're going to add a little bit of beef stock All right. to it. About two ounces. We're going to let uh, the beef stock reduce by half. And we're going to finish this off with some butter. This cold butter will thicken the sauce. So if you wanted to make the Brussels sprouts, but you weren't making duck or something like that to go along with it, how would you get started? Just with some oil? Yeah, just with a little olive oil. Um, kind of do it the same way. Just uh, add your olive oil and your garlic and your onion and then your Brussels sprouts and then hit it with your uh, balsamic vinegar. Awesome. And then whatever kind of stock you want, right? Yeah. Okay, and add a little bit of Italian seasoning at the end here. All right, because this would be a great side with so many dishes. Kick up the flavor a little bit. I think the duck's ready to come out of the oven. All right. 
now ready to plate the dish. All right. Put a little Brussels sprouts on the plate. Looks perfect. Just nicely add the duck to the Brussels sprouts. A little garnish. A little garnish on it. That looks beautiful and it smells amazing. Wonderful. Yes. Chef Paul, thank you so much. Thank you. This was awesome. Love being here. Living History Farms is an outdoor history museum in Urbandale, Iowa. Summer here is all about spending time outdoors and learning about life on the farm. But when the colder temperatures arrive, it's time to settle in next to a warm fire and enjoy some good food. From October through April, Living History Farms offers historic meals in three different styles and settings. For guests of the 1900 farmhouse, the evening begins with a horse-drawn wagon ride. Well, when visitors come to a historic dinner at Living History Farms, they can really expect a two and a half to three hour experience. It's not just a dinner, you're actually going to learn a little bit about history because you're going to be served by historic interpreters who are actually in period clothing. Um, like I said, the team of Percher on draft horses, and that would have been the most popular um, breed of draft here in Iowa at the turn of the century. Once their eyes have adjusted to the lamplight, the visitors immerse themselves in the early 1900s with an authentic farm dinner. Much of the meal is prepared over a wood-burning stove and is served family style. Okay, guys, welcome to the table here at 1900. You guys are having a roasted ham dinner this evening, and ham would be common here in a 1900 farm. The peas are called French peas, and in 1900, it was the end of the Victorian times. If you could make your meal sound a little bit French, that meant it was fancy. Um, the other vegetable you have, the orange-colored one, is a very seasonal vegetable for this time of year. It is a mashed winter squash. A lot of time is kind of what goes into it. I usually tell the guests that the recipes aren't particularly difficult, but it's the amount of time that you might put into doing Thanksgiving dinner. It's a good idea to come hungry because there is a lot of food. After dinner, guests are offered a chance to stretch their legs with a barnyard tour. These are a couple of our sows that we've got here at the farm. Um, their job is solely to make more pigs, but pigs would be the cash crop on a turn of the century farm. Another experience at Living History Farms takes us back in time just a little further to 1875. Well, welcome to the Tangen House. We're so glad you came to dinner. Things are a little bit fancier here at the Victorian Tangen Home. My name is Lucy and I've been your cook this afternoon, so if you have any questions about any of the food, be sure to ask. Guests are treated to several dishes here. Soup, roast pork, pureed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, French peas, dinner rolls, and a marbled spice cake with pears and whipped cream for dessert. We hear that it's just really a chance to just step back in time and just learn about what it would have been like to have lived in the respective time period. People love the food. The food is, you know, made with real butter and lard and, and all the, the delicious food, the ingredients that uh, we used to cook with more. After your meal, you're going to go into the parlor and you're going to play some Victorian parlor games. Okay, you may now open your eyes and stand up. And just people really enjoy whether they're booking a reservation for two people when they're going to meet new friends at the table, or if they're booking the whole table and it's a family experience. Um, it's just really a memorable time for everyone who comes out here. 
That's it for this week's episode. I'm Charity Nebbe. Join us next time for another beautiful food journey across our state on Iowa Ingredient. All of us at Iowa Ingredient are fans of all things celebrating Iowa food. And in 2015 and early 2016, we visited the terrific restaurants, farms, and other food events featured on this program. But circumstances can change, so we encourage you to call ahead if you're planning a trip of your own. We hope that you get the opportunity to indulge in some of Iowa's delicious flavors and to visit some of our unique destinations. Thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Ingredient has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, a grant from the W.T. and Edna M. Dahl Trust, Chef Lisa Laval of Trellis Cafe and Chef Michael Laval of the Des Moines Embassy Club. For more than 100 years, the Des Moines Embassy Club has provided a place to dine, celebrate, and do business. Located in downtown Des Moines and in West Des Moines, details are at embassyclub.com. New Pioneer Food Co-op offering local and organic groceries in Iowa City, Coralville, and Cedar Rapids. Everyone's welcome to shop the co-op, where local and organic isn't just a corner of the store, it's the cornerstone of everything they do. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. Mid-American Energy and their Energy Advantage programs are dedicated to increasing the awareness of energy efficiency in Iowa's homes and businesses. Information is at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service.